Hello, um, I hope you're all enjoying Transformations. My name's Tanya Davidge and I'll be the chair for this session. Um, this session is looking at action in the field, feminist practice. Um, and I'd like to begin just by um, reflecting on the generosity, I think, of the women we've seen speak uh, so far today. Um, a lot of the women that we've seen speak freely give their time um, to do what they do and I think that's really interesting just to think about the passion that it takes to do that um, and this generosity uh, is interesting because we're going to look in this session at what it means to take this generosity outside of this space that we're currently in so what we're going to do is we're going to look at how practitioners and researchers are helping to create more equitable built environments um, environments that welcome and support underrepresented groups and disadvantaged communities. We're going to be looking today at equity on housing. And to help us do that, we have two fantastic speakers. We have Sophie Dyring and Sam Donnelly. Sophie's the director of Shored Projects, uh, an accomplished cross-disciplinary design studio. She's a passionate, affordable housing advocate, and she's an architect and a landscape architect. Her practice designs and delivers social and affordable housing for those who are most in need. And she works with both public and private clients, including state government departments, Victorian municipalities and housing associations. Um, in, a, in kind of addition to doing this, she complements her practice as a member of South Australia's Office uh, for Design and Architecture's Design Review Panel and as a member of the Moreland Affordable Housing Committee. Um, she's also a sessional design lecturer at RMIT University, an author and a professional mentor. Um, Sam Donnelly, I have to admit to studying with Sam at university, at the University of Adelaide a very long time ago. And um, while I was slow to grow into my activism, Sam was an activist even then. Sam currently lectures at the University of Technology, Sydney, in the School of Architecture. She's a PhD candidate here in Melbourne with the XYX Lab, where she's researching the existing spatial conditions of women's refuges, exploring the possible effects or benefits of bespoke architectural design through working with women who've experienced violence. Her research sits at the intersection of several fields of knowledge, architectural design, domestic and family violence and its effects on women, the effects of gender on the occupation of space and sustainable, uh, and sustainable crisis and transitional accommodation. Um, and so what Sam and Sophie will do is they will um, each give a short presentation about their work um, and then we're going to have a chat um, and answer hopefully all of the questions or at least some of the questions you might have uh, as our audience. Thank you. Um, Sophie, are you... Oh, sorry, excuse me. Sam apparently is number one. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's a real honour to be here in, in this space and to be able to talk to you about um, some of the work that I'm doing, um, which has a lot to do with um, being able to talk to people and get feedback. It's, it's one of those really fantastic subjects that I can't do on my own because I don't have the experience. I rely on the lived experience of people and, and practitioners. So I'll, t I'll be talking to you today about my practice as an architect, but also focusing a lot on my topic, um, PhD, which is looking specifically at, um, at spaces for women and children who have experienced... Uh, violence. Um, it all started in um, about eight years ago when I was working in practice. I was called up by a friend who wanted me to come and fix um, a situation that she had in one of the refuges that she was managing. And she said, it's a really, really simple job. I just want you to come and fix the kitchen in the refuge. All the women are fighting in the refuge. You know, they've come out of domestic violence, they're now in the refuge and they're all fighting and I want you to get rid of the kitchen because that's the course of the violence. And so this kind of crazy job started where we got rid of the kitchen and we put kitchenettes in all of the rooms and we basically made them into self-contained units. But then we started to realise that we did need common spaces and that there was a whole raft of space out the back that we then started to fill up with transitional housing. 
So the very small job of removing a kitchen became um, a career for me and a, a real interest in, in the difficulty of designing a space like this. It wasn't just a house, it wasn't a hospital, it wasn't a mental health clinic and it wasn't a childcare centre but it was every, all of those all at the same time. And some of them worked really well and some of them didn't work so well and it depended on who was there and at what time. So this was the first refuge that I worked on, sorry it's the wrong um, note, uh, with Constructive Dialogue Architects and it's in the northern beaches of Sydney and this image shows the, one of the transitional housing units which the, um, so this unit houses up to three children and a mother and it opens up onto what was a great courtyard space that was developed by putting in the transitional housing. This is Elsie's Women's Night Refuge, which is the first refuge in Australia. So this was 45 years ago. Um, it was started in two existing terrace houses in, in Glebe, which were abandoned, and four women decided that they'd had enough of the violence and they were going to take over these two terrace houses and open them up to women who needed to escape violence. And within a week, these two spaces were completely overrun with women needing um, refuge from being in really um, violent situations. And so the women, and this was all done just out of activism. You know, they didn't ask permission, they just did it. And eventually the government realised that what they had on their hands was a real problem and they, they decided that if they didn't fund this there was going to be a, a complete riot on their hands. So Elsie's um, still exists today in a, in a very different form. Um, it was taken over in what terms of the reforms where the, um, an, a religious organisation took it over and turned it into a generic refuge for all sorts of people, not just for violence. So um, slowly it's transitioned into something which it wasn't in the beginning, but in the recent years it seems to be transitioning back into a, a, a violence-specific um, space. So in my research I've started to try and work out what is the journey that a woman has to take um, when she decides to leave the home and it's a really kind of complicated and um, it's a complicated and singular journey that each woman takes. It's difficult to say that all women face this kind of journey. Uh, re research shows that a woman will leave home nine times and go to a refuge nine times before she decides to leave altogether. So it's this kind of bouncing back effect of leaving home and then going back home. Um, there's a whole lot of reasons for this and it's a very complicated journey which sometimes involves going to transitional housing. A lot of times it means that a woman will be homeless. She might live in her car, she might live with a re uh, relative, she might couch surf for several months before she finally decides to go to a refuge. So each of these situations, um, the refuge is kind of the gatehouse where change can start to occur. So it's like, it's like in a really important architectural space for a woman to feel safe, supported and stable for possibly the first time in a very long time. So for that reason the architecture of this space is actually <coughs> incredibly important. And some of the spatial needs um, are very specific, so it needs to be safe but not a prison, it needs to be dignified, um, it needs to be very private but not in the sense that you're completely excluded, um, it needs to be comfortable but you can't be so comfortable that you, can't, you, you feel like you can't leave. Um, it has to be child focused and child meaning from the ages of 0 to 18. And it also has to promote a sense of independence. So you need to be able to um, instill a sense in, in women and children that they can leave and then they can lead a, a better life after the refuge. And the, all of these pressures um, exist in that architectural space. So it's, it's a lot to do with the services, but I'm trying to find out if architecture can actually have an effect on, on that transition as well. <coughs> So it's led me to try and work out what does design for women mean. So if we're designing spaces specifically for women and children, what does that space actually look like? Um, does it look like these kind of idyllic scenes where women are looking after children <coughs> and 
you know, living in these very pristine, organized environments, like in the 1600s in the Netherlands. Um, how do we look at spaces for women in terms of physical space? So we've, we all know about Le Corbe's modular man and how everything's related to the size of a man and, uh, you know, the strength of a man. But then there's a, there's a sketch that exists about modular woman and even even that's kind of wrong in a sense because she's still 1.8 meters tall. So what happens when you start to get women of different, different scales, different um, cultures, different abilities? Um, and this is where the refuge needs to, it's not a home for one person, it's a home for somebody who might be disabled or for somebody who might not have all of the men mental faculties because of what she's gone through to be able to live a, a normal, kind of, a, stable existence. So there are three main questions that I've um, started to address in the research. First is what spatial form does a refuge require? Um, when you talk to people about women's refuges, most people assume that the refuge is like a fortress or a, you know, a hidden space in the suburbs. Um, so I'm trying to question is that actually the fact or is that the truth? Um, what are the physical spaces in a refuge? Are they institutional type spaces where you have a whole kind of series of bedrooms and a common area? Are they more like a core and cluster model where you have independent living units? There are so many different types of refuges when you start to look at how each community addresses this problem and nobody's actually documented that so I'm, I'm getting a lot of really interesting data on that. Um, what kind of typology would a refuge space look like? So what kind of space, what kind of spatial needs are common to all of those um, services? And how does a refuge space operate at different scales? So starting to look at the different areas within a refuge are quite interesting and how it relates to a community is a different thing to how does the bedroom in a refuge actually relate to the rest of the building. Second question is how can architectural design support the perception of particular psychological, physical and emotional safety of women and children. Part of the really interesting thing that I'm researching is the effect of dom domestic violence on children is so profound that if we can somehow stop violence with the children then perhaps we've got a chance at stopping violence altogether. And a lot of this effect is, you know, children's memories are very closely related to physical spaces that they're in. And so I'm wondering how you can make an architectural space that children will then instantly kind of gel with and be able to have a much more healing um, situation when they're in, in a refuge. And the third question is about what, what is architecture's responsibility in this conflict? Can architectural design actually make the difference that we hope it will? Um, is defensible space possible to achieve through architectural space alone or does it need to be a whole raft of other things? Um, can bespoke design be adapted to existing types of refuge space? There are a lot of refuges that exist that need updating and upgrading. Um, so how can we adapt refits? And what does a future refuge look like? What does a fit for purpose refuge look like when you, when you design it from scratch? So what I've done in the last six months is put together from research, from talking to providers, um, I've put together a draft version of a design guide or a design handbook because I keep getting asked from the providers, we just need some kind of direction in how we can set up our space in a better way. And they keep asking for a guidebook. They want something that they can take and adapt to their own purpose. So I've put together this guide which goes through a series of different scales from contextual level to a community level, um, talking about the teams that you require to set up to run a really successful design project for a refuge, um, talking about the kind of communal spaces, how do you stop people from fighting in the kitchen when you actually do need a common space in the kitchen. Um, a lot of it's about landscaping. Landscaping is incredibly important in terms of it feeling like a home and feeling like not a prison and people don't don't tend to think about landscape as being important in a refuge. They think of it as being defensible interior space rather than defensible exterior <coughs> space as well. Um, and then how does the community address the refuge? Does it really have to be anonymous? 
if we could say that this was a women's refuge in a more public way and this is a safe space for women, then perhaps we would encourage more women to go to refuges more openly and it would, um, it would create a much safer transition. Um, and then down to the individual level. So these are all sketches that I've done while I've been in the refuges. There's obviously a lot to do with anonymity, so I had to work out how, how could I document some of the, the interesting moments within the refuge without taking photographs and then dealing with the um, privacy issues. <coughs> um, and deep, there's some interesting kind of simple ideas about um, storage and pets and how you do really simple things within refuges to make them operate better. Like if you have really good storage, it becomes a more trauma-informed space because it's karma and there's a sense of order, which often the women haven't had for many years. Um, if you can take your pet there, then it's a sense that you know everybody's included, even the, even the pets. So in, so in my work, it's about resisting what we make assumptions about. And I'm trying to do this both in my PhD but also in my teaching and getting uh, women students to actually start to front up and, and be the strength that I think we need as women designers. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Such important work. Uh, today, um, I'll be speaking about three projects um, that my practice um, is working on or has completed in the last few years. We predominantly work in the social housing field. Um, so these are all social housing projects with community housing providers um, in Melbourne. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. It was important for me to open on this slide because um, at the heart of our work is always the occupant or the resident. Um, even though we're somewhat removed from them, um, the designs are still speculative because we design for groups of people and not individuals. But um, this is Deb and she was one of the first residents to move into our transportable housing project in Footscray. Um, and it's the first home that she's had in 35 years. Um, and it's, it's been incredible for her. She speaks quite openly about the trauma that she went through in her early teenage years um, and that finally having a home has allowed her to settle and deal with other aspects of her life. <coughs> uh, so this is the transportable housing project, um, Harris Transportable Ho Housing Project with Launch Housing in Footscray. Um, it currently is 14 dwellings for people who are homeless or are at risk of homelessness. Um, when it's completed it will be 57 dwellings um, across nine sites and 14 titles. Um, and they're all on Vic Road's land along Ballarat Road and Footscray. Um, the little unit is called Freddie um, and Freddie began life many years ago in my studio as um, uh, competition entry to an international design competition to address affordable um, housing options for people at risk of homelessness um, and this was our entry specifically addressing um, teenagers homeless within the CBD of Melbourne. Um, it got a life and, and now has, has become a reality. Uh, the dwellings are all um, Modular construction, they're completely 100% fabricated in a factory environment. Um, and these were made in uh, Horsham. They are then put on the back of a truck um, and brought to site, fully constructed. Prior to their arrival, the services are all run in uh, to, the, to the spots where they'll be landing and then they're hooked up in a day. So it's a really a plug and play um, solution, built solution. Um, these, as I said, these sites are owned by Vic Road, so there's a five-year lease agreement between uh, Vic Roads um, and Launch Housing by the DHHS, um, and if the land is ever acquired for road widening in the future, they'll be given a 12-month notice, um, and Vic Roads will help them find an alternative site for these to move onto, um, in which case they'll be disconnected from the services, put on the back of the truck again and, and relocated. 
Um, central to our work um, is uh, the question, I guess, of individuality um, for our tenants when we don't know specifically who these people um, who, who will live in our um, dwellings in the end. These are not the final colour schemes, but it was a slide I wanted to show um, because we did um, specifically design four colour schemes for these 57 dwellings. So when you arrive um, at, to your plot of land, to your small kind of house and, and lot package, um, it is more than likely that your dwelling is not going to look the same as your neighbours. So it's certainly not like a caravan park approach to small transportable dwellings. There's individuality through the colours. They're 20 square metres internally. That's um, predominantly on the ground floor, but there is a mezzanine level over the bathroom. They are independent living, so um, there's no um, shared facilities on these sites. They're, these units all have their own kitchen, bathroom, sleeping and living areas. Um, they have a north-facing courtyard, if that's the particular orientation um, of the unit, and a service um, um, deck to the rear. Um, and some interior shots before clients moved in. Obviously, um, all of our photos are taken before residents move in due to privacy um, and, and being respectful to them. These did come furnished um, if the residents um, wanted that, but they, they, also became, they were also offered as unfurnished dwellings if um, people did have their own belongings to, or furniture to bring. The second project is um, the Coburg townhouses that we did with women's property initiatives completed back in 2016. It's on a site in Coburg on the upfield train line and bike path um, and very close to <coughs> amenities, so um, close to primary schools, public transport, shops um, and recreation facilities. There's seven townhouses on a reasonably small suburban lot, um, two two bedrooms and five one bedrooms. Uh, and each courtyard has three um, outside areas on offer. There's the shared, um, there's the access way, which is also designed as a shared, shared space. Um, east facing <coughs> courtyards and west facing terraces on the first floor. Um, living, dining, eating on ground floor and um, sleeping in bathrooms on the first floor. The um, access way that we designed as a shared space was an important element of this project for us. Um, rather than it just being a space that you pass through to access your um, front gate, um, we designed it very specifically as an area that could foster some on-site community. Uh, so there's um, seating, <coughs> fixed seating, um, either individual or in clusters. There's um, bike parking, undercover bike parking out there um, and um, when we handed it over there was a lot of productive um, planting in the garden bed, so lemons, rosemary, um, something else I've forgotten, but um, I understand now the residents have, some of them that are very interested in fostering community have replaced a lot of that planting with um, many more um, happy um, colourful flowers, which is a, a note to sell for next landscape designs. Uh, this is um, the east facing terrace. Um, one of the residents shared some photos with me um, of how she has customised that space for her um, and also how she's customised her west facing terrace. Uh, the materiality and form uh, is also important when it comes back to the residents. So we've often had conversations um, with the housing providers um, to avoid any kind of uh, architecture, built form, language, materiality that could bring any kind of stigma to the residents. So it's very important that our work, um, that the outcome is embedded in context um, and domestic forms and materials so that there's it's, it's not a building that's uh, shouting out that it's different in the street. Um, for uh, this project, with Winwin's Properties Initiatives, all of their tenants are women and children. Um, and specifically for that group of residents, we wanted to inject moments of luxury. We work on very tight budgets. Um, so they are literally just moments of luxury. So the one here I wanted to point out was the pendant light um, over the dining room table. 
Um, in the bathroom, a small timber detail for some warmth in there. Um, um, taking the um, height above the staircase and introducing nighttime purging. And within the bedroom spaces, having a cathedral ceiling to, to also maximise the um, volume and space in there and the little addition of a small walk in robe. And I guess also that idea of luxury or moments of dignity or joy also plays out in this project with the um, yellow suffete. Uh, affordability um, runs through our social um, housing work on, on all levels, um, but one that's particularly important is how these houses um, operate in terms of cost to the tenants um, when they move in. So we um, embed as many passive design principles as we can in our work. Um, this project didn't have ideal orientation. The townhouses run um, east-west, um, but there's still cross-ventilation, double glazing, the nighttime purging that I've mentioned, um, and um, so some solar protection from the western sun. Uh, the third project is really a group of projects that we are working with Aboriginal Housing uh, Victoria on. Uh, and what's very important for me, um, being a um, non-Aboriginal person, is these design principles that were given to us at the start of the process. So these seven guiding um, principles were worked through um, with Aboriginal Housing Victoria with their tenants, so it was very important for us to work with these so there was um, a connection to the future residents um, and rather than a top-down approach trying to um, reduce that or, or um, minimise that in some way. Uh, and the ones today I'll probably touch on is the connection to country, which we try and do through landscape, um, being culturally responsive, which we attempt to do through materiality, um, and size matters. Uh, so originally we were approached by Aboriginal Housing Victoria to design just one um, townhouse type. Um, so they've recently had a lot of um, titles signed over to them for self-governance, properties that they were managing and now, now they own them, about 1,500 <laughs> properties. And a lot of those are not fit for purpose. Um, so they've started a large redevelopment um, program and they really had hoped that they could just design um, one townhouse and kind of roll it out across many sites in South um, East Melbourne. Um, and we did design this one, and it is a townhouse we um, use. Uh, very strong, uh, so north-facing living spaces were essential and uh, an immediate relationship to the north-facing external space, <coughs> having that adjacency so the family can expand and contract um, as people gather and, and, and move, um, and using fenestrations to have a strong visual connection to the landscape. Um, so we developed that type and then looked at it further and um, understood that there are lots of different kind of site sizes, um, geometries and orientations, and that one townhouse wouldn't, was not a one size fits all um, uh, solution. Uh, so if we did <coughs> rotate this townhouse 90 degrees to fit on sites, it, it wasn't optimal, optimal to north, the, the living spaces and the connection to the outdoor spaces uh, was lost. So we have designed a second type in consultation with them. So now we have the two townhouse types um, that work across the different um, <coughs> sites that they have. Um, both of them are reasonably generous in size. They're about 110 square metres for two bedroom. Um, and we design housing for the DHHS at 80 square metres for two bedroom. Um, and an important aspect for me too was to have a specific study space, a dedicated study space. So what had come up in the um, literature behind the seven design principles so the tenants was that there was nowhere um, in the housing that they had currently for um, their kids to study. Um, so I thought that was an incredibly poor um, outcome. So um, each of the types we've designed has a dedicated study space for them. Uh, with most of the work that we do in social housing and, in fact, for private clients, we have the um, incredible opportunity to integrate landscape and architecture, and that's what we've 
been given the opportunity to do with Aboriginal Housing Victoria. So we've worked very closely with them on the plant um, palette and selection, so Indigenous um, species and also a couple of species that have um, Indigenous um, uses. Um, and the plan just illustrating there that we've tried to, um, even though we've, um, you know, the site's working very hard with the three townhouses on it and these projects kind of need to work hard too because the more housing we can get on them or the more thoughtfully designed livable housing we can get on them, the more people who need housing have it. Um, but surrounding it by landscapes, there's that visual connection when you're inside um, back to the landscape. Uh, this is my final slide. So on one of the jobs that's under construction in Doveton, the, the one that I've just shown the plan of, so that, that central area there in the middle um, is actually for three cars. Um, but the idea here again, uh, similar to what we tried to um, inject in the Coburg townhouses, that um, if there's an on-site community that does begin to blossom um, here, that the cars can be pulled out and it can be a shared zone. So it can be a much larger space um, to gather or um, even if one family wanted that and, and the others were amenable for them using it for a day or an afternoon. Thank you. Okay, um, so now I get to ask a few questions and then we'll hand over to the audience to ask a few questions. We don't have a mic for this session so you'll just have to speak up, I'm sure um, you can all manage. Um, but I thought we could talk by starting um, with a little bit about yourselves. So um, what drives your activism in this space? What got you here? Why are you here? Um, Yes. <laughs> um, uh, it's my it's my background. So my mum is that on? Yeah. Is that on? Um, I grew up in a single uh, parent household. My mum was a working mum. She was a nurse. Um, she has um, an incredible ability to consider the value of everyone. Um, and I didn't realise how that fed in. I guess until what about ten years ago, when I started pursuing. Um, a social agenda within my practice. Um, so, I, yeah, I have mum to thank, I think. <laughs> um, my story is to do the same. She's also a nurse, and she would yell at me, you bloody university students know nothing. You don't know what you're talking about. It kind of, yeah, it just gave me the challenge to try and prove to her that, you know, we could do good. We weren't just going to go off and do a PhD in something that wasn't useful. So, she still calls me useless today, though. <laughs> but she's your mum, so she's allowed to, so that's okay. And you have to take it, quite frankly. Um, I think it's really interesting that you both have met through this space and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about the collaborations you're working on together. Um, I'm really lucky, I, I decided to do my PhD through Monash and in starting that work um, my supervisor Naomi said you've got to meet Sophie, she's doing some fantastic work, I think you both get along really well and that was kind of the catalyst, um, which has not only helped what I'm doing in my research, but it's completely changed the way that I think about the next five or ten years. There's, there's so many projects that we could easily be working on um, really soon because of what we're doing now. So I think it's been really lucky. We've, this year we um, collaborated on the Melbourne Design Week um, symposium where we had three sessions looking at affordable housing for women specifically. So one was about women and housing, one was about homelessness and one was about Indigenous uh, women and design um, in terms of housing. So that was probably our first project together um, and there's and can I just make a comment here? I went to some of those sessions and they were absolutely amazing. They were, um, it wasn't only about the difference design could make in this space, but it was about people with lived experience, about the providers, about people who are fundraising around this space. And what you understand, or what I understood from that, was just how many people and the complexity 
of it, how many people it takes to get it right, you know, but then the ability to get it right is quite a powerful, um, yeah, thing. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I think um, we both um, have the position that representation is incredibly important, so um, we work very hard to pull those panels together to have everyone represented at the table. Mm. Um, yeah, and I guess representation leads on to our, in a way, um, our second project is the, uh, we've just been awarded the Lord Mayor Charitable Foundation Grant, an innovation grant to do post-occupancy research on housing for women. So um, we'll look at a number of my projects, but we'll also look at um, other projects that have been designed for women that, um, that I haven't been involved with um, specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and we, uh, the objective there is to find out if the assumptions that I've been making and other designers have been making um, do play out in the way that we've um, mm -hmm. uh, assumed for the, for the <coughs> residents and, and occupants of these buildings. So that's mm -hmm. incredibly exciting. And so how will you, like, what will that research involve? Like, what do you, I mean, I know it's early days in it, but what do you imagine doing and how difficult will that be? In terms of, I mean, especially in terms of the privacy issues that came up in both of your talks, which I thought was quite um, interesting and, and also quite, I would imagine, quite challenging. Yeah, Sam's in charge of the ethics part. Of <laughs> Good luck with that. We will interview oh. residents mm -hmm. um, that live in the properties currently and also do. Um, secondary research on uh, drawings and photographs of built work and try and bring that together. Mm -hmm. um, but Sam can speak more to the privacy around that. Mm. Um, oh. So we've, we'll set up a series of really targeted, very specific interviews talking to residents about their experience with the spaces particularly to try and keep it, the conversation really centred on how their relationship with their space um, has developed and what the good things are about the space and what the, the issues are with the space to try and get a much broader um, experiential feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's quite interesting that in this space, I think that the um, the community housing providers are kind of doing what government would have traditionally done a while back. Is it, um, do you imagine talking to them about the kind of, um, their perspective on what the housing's doing as well? Well, we, we've set it up so that we get the user's feedback first and then mm -hmm. we open that up to a, an expert panel and we get them to talk to our work in the next stage so that it's the users first. Yeah. And then we'll take it back to the users after the experts have been through it. Um, so that at the end the report will have this kind of layering in it that has a lot of feedback loops from the users, but also the, the professional input from mm -hmm. um, people that are providing and funding and you know, um, experts that are looking at um, health and well-being and sustainability. So it'll have a lot of kind of outlying um, information that needs to be fed into it. Mm -hmm. I think it was quite interesting. I went up a couple of weekends ago to see the Bendigo Hospital landscape designed by Oculus and Paul Thompson, I think his name is. Sorry if I've got it wrong. Um, and it was really fascinating to hear Claire Martin speak about the relationship between landscape and well-being and the fact that you both identified that um, in both in women's refuges and in more stable kind of um, housing solutions for women and children. Like, how do you, um, do you or would you like to comment, I suppose, a little bit more on that? Um, I, don't, I don't know if this is good or bad or naive thing, but I often just try and put myself in all these situations and I kind of understand how important landscape is to me and, and in fact kind of everyone around me, so I mean every landscape is my happy place. If it's not a good day, the first thing I do is go down to the arrow and walk, which is mm -hmm. yeah, downtown. So um, I think it's important for all of us to have that connection. 
mm. back to that. And I think the understanding between the connection between well-being and uh, yeah, and feeling like you're home um, has become much better articulated in recent years, which is lovely to see. Um, I might ask one more question and then open it up. Um, so, in your experience, do you think that accommodation for housing uh, for housing women differs from different types of accommodation and housing? I'm, I'm starting to really question that maybe, and we were talking about this earlier, it's more about access to housing and it's not, I mean a house for a woman is not necessarily going to be different to a house for a, a man or a, a non-gender specific but, person, but it's more about how do we allow access to all sorts of different people rather than just those who can get it first. Mm -hmm. uh, and how the, I think, Part of the question is also about how do we design so that elements of the design speak to women in particular ways. So for me, the, um, it's a lot about the Virginia Woolf, having a room of your own. You know, women often don't have any space of their own. And if, if you can design a space in which a woman can have her own space, uh, which is really odd to think of, because mm. quite often we never allocate that space like the study. Um, or if you make a kitchen, for example, a kitchen is where a woman spends a lot of time. If you make that space so that it's easy to look at the kids and you're not constantly struggling, struggling with the kitchen and set up, um, the design can actually help that be a much better functioning space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's a tricky one. I think I don't have the exact answer. But maybe... Um, some will evolve through this, the grant and the research that we'll do in the coming year. Um, you know, uh, we often think about storage, and I might think about storage, specific storage solutions more for a house for a woman, perhaps, but everyone needs, you know, storage. Um, I guess with the townhouses, the idea of kind of small moments of luxury is maybe not an idea that I would apply to housing. Of, you know, for men perhaps, but um, I think that all the functional and performance-based requirements of housing probably doesn't differ very much from person to person. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Okay, um, maybe we'll open up for questions. There's one in the back there. Oh, you just have to stand up and speak and project, please. <laughs> Hi guys. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. It's really interesting. Um, following on from that question about a home and having a place where you feel safe and you belong, I wanted to actually ask, probably maybe quite a boring option, but about space standards. Um, and in London, it's something we struggle with quite a lot because we're very restricted. We're not allowed to design a home under 37 metres squared for a one bed, one person home. Um, I noticed particularly so for some of the schemes, the, the Freddie scheme that you showed, for example. I loved it, but in London, we really struggled to get that past the authority, even though obviously it's providing much needed housing. It's I see it as preventing homelessness and it's clearly creating a, a great place for people want to live. Is that something that you struggle with? Have you had to get around kind of space standards or has it been quite well accepted? <coughs> uh, I, I, until this week I've never been pulled up on the size at all um, and maybe that's because I always have an opportunity to speak firstly about its thoughtful design because we've considered even though it's 20 square metres but we know um, and have designed for where clothes can go and where clothes can hang and where crockery and cutlery can go and where your food can go. So there's the storage space for and, um, everything. Um, I was having a conversation this week and yeah, someone said, oh, this would never stand up to the apartment guidelines we have in Melbourne now. Um, I don't do apartments, so I don't know what the standards are, but that's, that's the first time in... Um, you know, that project's been around a couple of years now that I've been pulled up on size. But I don't, my personal opinion is I don't think size matters. If it's thoughtfully designed, if, it, if it's got the right orientation, if there's passive design principles, um, there's a double skin on those Freddie units, so there's um, acoustic separation from the traffic noise on Ballarat Road. Um, so even though they're very small, they're very comfortable. Yep. <laughs> um, how do you deal with 
the tension between this um, size restrictions and all abilities access? That was kind of an operational um, decision by Launch Housing um, that they... Um, so we had a, um, a, I can't remember exact title, but it's a community consultation woman um, deal with us, a uh, deal with the project, she was part of the project from time to time, and she had limited um, mobility. Um, uh, so she came to see the prototype a couple of times and gave her feedback. And it wasn't um, a home that she could live in because of her limited mobility, but still gave it the thumbs up. Um, but launch, um, it was an operational decision for them to still go with it. Some have a single step, some have two steps. They do have um, a handrail, um, and the bed is on the ground floor rather than there's a name, but it was an operational decision for them, and, and no policy or regulation, um, amazingly actually, given all the red tape we deal with, came up. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. bizarre. Um, a question here, and if you guys could just hold the mic a little bit. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> I worked it out. interesting, isn't it, this idea of data and research coming up again and in some ways like what you're doing is actually quite disruptive because you don't know if what's happening is we're actually really working, it's almost, is it anecdotally working, what's the, you know, what do, what do you go on? Um, so it's quite a fascinating next step. How long do you see the um, research taking? Oh. Hop to it. Yeah. <laughs> you better get that ethics clearance really quickly. <laughs> oh my god. Um, any? Have we got any other questions? Ah, yes. Pia. Yeah, I just also wanted to pick up on the, the what we're talking about with the landscape aspect. Both of you spoke about the pets and also uh, um, in some respects in the images. And I mean, there's a fair bit of work, um, research that's coming up at the moment talking about the relationship between well-being and connections to the non-human, the non human And I'm just wondering whether, um, I think that because you're both dealing with, or because these projects are dealing with people that um, are in need and are vulnerable, and that that connection may be even more important. <coughs> information in terms of trauma-informed spaces and how um, people dealing with trauma need to have exterior spaces and natural ventilation and sunlight and access to green room um, being really important and looking at some of, a lot of the refuges that I visit, the garden is the kind of forgotten space and it's the, it's the dream of all of the providers to make this, you know, the gardens is the one thing they want to make better, a better a better space for women actually to be in. Because um, you get things like smokers areas, you're going to have somewhere for women to be able to go and have a cigarette while the kids are playing. Um, and that 
So in terms of giving the women dignity, I think the landscape becomes part of that really important room outside that we as designers could actually make much better, much better. It's a, it's a fast job. You don't have to build it. You can, you can grow that. Uh, it was exciting for me to work on the transporter halls project because I think it was a, it's a shift in um, some of the providers. So they, um, they're allowed to have pets um, there. Deb has her pet Zeus, her dog Zeus, um, living with her now. And it's one of the things that can prevent, not, not all the people moving into the transporter halls are rough sleepers by any means, but it is one of the things that prevents some rough sleepers getting off the streets that they have nowhere to go because they can't take their pets. Um, which just breaks my heart. So um, it was wonderful that, yeah, on the transportables project, if you... So the first site that was released with six um, houses, three of them have dogs. I also, um, I went to a talk recently where somebody spoke about the fact that victims of domestic violence um, with pets often find it hard to leave for the same reason. And there's that cycle as well, which is really interesting. Um, does anybody have one last pressing question? Yes? Yeah, I'm a landscape architect, so I've worked across a range of different projects in the public and private sectors, and often we get left off at the end of projects that come to construction because of very dangerous processes. I was wondering what your experience is in your work where you talk about the garden being so important, but in my experience it's often gets cut from projects, housing and schools and things like that. <coughs> um, is there a budget for Spaces, or the same um, so I, I've recently completed a landscape on um, a refuge in Melbourne that's one of the first ones to be rolled out after the Royal Commission. Um, so I think it's, well our budget was slashed so like 50% of the plants went and they all went down to tube stock so it's not like the beautiful undulating colourful meadow that I'd envisaged um, and it won't be back for some time um, but I guess if you get some of the spaces right like the um, now the operators have come in they will reach out to the community and hopefully get more plants donated by Bunnings or whoever and, and fill that gap that the budget um, provided in the um, housing projects, I think um, through the planning process now, at least in the municipalities that I'm working in, landscape um, is part of the endorsed um, um, town planning package, so it's getting embedded there now, which I think is helpful. Um, so I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and ask the last question. Um, I think it's really interesting at the moment that in this space we're starting to talk about housing as infrastructure at a, at a political level. Um, and so this is really good at a certain level, yeah, because it means we're thinking about funding this type of housing. Um, and we're thinking about affordable housing and we're thinking about social and public housing. Um, but I think the reality is, is that housing differs from infrastructure. You know, it's not about kind of engineering or efficiency. Um, it's about people and community and it's about empathy and care and what I think is really beautiful about the way you both speak about these spaces is that neither of you are delivering housing, you're both delivering homes, you're thinking really thoughtfully um, about how these spaces become homes for people um, and I think that it's because you um, exhibit empathy and care essentially and I think we need to have more conversations about empathy it's already come up actually today already and care um, and not just thinking and talking about empathy and care but acting with empathy and care <coughs> and so I was curious to um, to know in your experiences how we might better develop empathy and care as architects and as people who teach architecture students? Um, and what tools do you think that architects need to develop in this space? I, um, I ran a studio with health, architecture and landscape students all in the same space. And the brief was to design a women's refuge. Um, and we had a real project, a real proposal to talk to them. And I set up the, land the landscape students in the project because I didn't want the architects to lead it for once. And the health <laughs> students had to give the architects and the landscapes um, background knowledge 
in terms of what, what do people need when they're in high stakes of trauma. And the health lecturer and I mapped their empathy, the change in their empathy levels across the course. So we measured at the beginning and then we measured at the end, which is really interesting. And we used a really terrible scenario at both stages to try and test how the students were reacting. And the changes in empathy, we, I don't think we measured, I don't think the scale measured the changes in empathy very well because the empathy had kind of really strange patterns. But the comments that the students came back with about the empathy that they got from working with each other in a team were really kind of shocking to us because we just thought that it was something that they would react badly to. But they valued each other's knowledge even though they knew the other person was a student even more than the fact that they've done a great job, it was that kind of forging of a relationship and that they knew now that they, in practice they could always go and ask another, another practitioner about how to do something so they've got more experience. So that was a really interesting empathy exercise, I think. Um, so I'm a strong believer in housing first um, and if that doesn't come naturally to people um, I think yeah you just need to get in early so I just taught a design studio at RMIT as well and um, we had lots and lots of conversations with the students about people are going to live here you have to think about people being in this space and it, it was kind of a new concept to them. <laughs> it's a horrifying thought. We made them draw people. <gasps> no, what? Oh, never. Sounds awful. Um, <laughs> people, go ahead and forbid. Um, well, I think we've come to the end of our session. Is that correct? Yes, I'm getting the, the thumbs up. Um, I'd like to thank um, both of our very, very wonderful speakers. Thank you. Thank you.